Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Let the record show that um, we have all members of the board present and at this time there are four members while we wait uh, a new appointment. So I see that uh, Jess, Robin and Tom are on so we're all present. So I'm going to um, convene this meeting and the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report and I'll turn it over to Susan Barrett. Susan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. First, I wanted to let everyone know that the board received One Care Vermont's uh, FY22 budget earlier this month on October 1st and the 2022 certification form on August 30th, 2021. One Care will present their budget at a public board meeting on November 10th, 2021 and the Green Mountain Care Board staff will present their analysis on that budget on December 8th. So in order to have public comment received and uh, incorporated into that staff analysis, we're asking the public to comment by December 1st. And that presentation, as I said, will be on December 8th. I also wanted to announce that we have ongoing public comment regarding a potential next agreement all PR model agreement with the federal government, with CMMI. Um, we've been uh, asking for public comment since uh, February of this year. And any of the comments we receive, we share with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on a potential next agreement. I also want to make sure folks uh, see our press release for the meetings uh, for the rest of this month. Um, just to note, we are convening a meeting um, on Friday, October 15th. That's going to start at 10 a.m. And that is on the pre presentation by the board's prescription drug advisory group. And um, so note that on your calendar, please. And again, it starts at 10 a.m. And then uh, another um, meeting and something to note is that on October 20th, next Wednesday, we'll uh, have a review of the draft Vermont Healthcare Workforce Development Strategic Plan uh, from Ina Vakas, the Director of Healthcare Reform at AHS. Um, we do have a primary care advisory group on October 20th that evening, and then we also have our general advisory group on October 25th. Uh, that's from two to four. The primary care advisory group is from five to seven. And then the last Wednesday of this month, we'll be having an all day meeting. We're gonna start our meeting starting at 11 a.m. in the morning. We'll have a presentation on hospital payment and cost coverage variation from HMA Burns, and then in the afternoon, we'll be hearing about Vermont Hospital Quality Review and Capacity Planning in Preparation for Value-Based Care. Again, that starts at 1.30 as a reminder, and that is from uh, Berkeley Research Group. So please look at our calendar. We have a lot of events happening this month and a couple of meetings that are not the typical Wednesday afternoon starting at 1.00. So I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. The next item on the agenda are the minutes um, for approval. And I just want to uh, check with Abigail because I think that there might be a um, mistake on the date of the minutes for the Brattleboro reconsideration. I don't think that was a Monday, but I could be wrong. Let me take a look. OK, so I'm going to push the uh, minutes discussion off till later in the meeting. And at this point, um, we're going to move to um, the Green Mountain Care Board draft 2022-23 analytics plan. And I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Lindbergh. Sarah? Sarah. Oh, are you able to see my screen? We can. 
All right, fantastic. Well, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Lindbergh. I am the um, ostensible leader of the data and analytical team for the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'm here to present our uh, reporting and research report or priorities for 2022 and 2023. So, as a reminder, uh, if you haven't taken a look at our statute in a while, it's always um, quite daunting. We have a lot of duties under our um, auspices. So I pulled this out from 18 VSA 9410 um, to let you all know um, what I'm thinking of when I think about framing our duties as a data team. So we um, must maintain this healthcare database and it's got two major components. One is our all-payer claims database, VCARES. And the other is the hospital discharge data set, which we call VUDS. And these uh, together are designed to help the board complete some of its duties, which include determining capacity and distribution of existing resources, identifying healthcare needs and informing healthcare policy, evaluating the effectiveness of intervention programs on improving patient outcomes, comparing costs between various treatment settings and approaches, providing information to consumers and purchasers of health care, as well as improving the quality and affordability of patient health care and health care coverage. In addition to these um, duties, we also are required to make that data available as a resource um, to interested people throughout the state and beyond so that they may continuously review health care utilization, expenditures, and performance in Vermont. So um, maybe this is the, the old DFR in me, but I always like to start with my statutory charge when I think about these things. Um, so in addition to our duties, we do strive to produce timely and relevant information to support the work that you're all doing and partner with colleagues across the state in their efforts um, to reach the same ends. But we also have other hats that we have to wear in addition to this support, and that includes stewardship of our data resources, um, which also means that we support the Data Governance Council, which is a organization um, that is an offshoot of the board that helps us with those obligations. And we also have a lot of administrative and management duties, such as maintaining contracts and data use agreements um, with people who are providing the data to us. And we also offer support to other data users who are using the healthcare database so that we can get the data out there to have it fulfill its um, destiny. And also, um, I find that the best way to improve data is to have people use it. And so facilitating its use really helps us with that. So to review the, the analytic plan that we're getting ready to sunset at the end of 2021, there are essentially three main domains that we focused on expanding utility quality and the ease of use of our data resources, patient care, and regulatory integration. So in that first domain, there were two main focus areas. One was improving data products available to users. And under that um, bucket, we were able to complete um, a RFP that helped inform us on specifications for building data sets that are more ready to use for people. So for instance, if you are doing a fiscal analysis for the legislature, you need the data packaged in a much different way than say someone who's interested in population health outcomes. So getting some um, basic rules around building those data sets is complete. Um, we also deployed some new business intelligence tools and data marts within the vCure's secure environment. So that is um, prepackaged data um, that is ready for users to use and includes some Tableau visualizations for authorized users. Um, we did postpone our solicitation of voluntary submissions to vCures. The reason that has been postponed is that there has been some movement on the federal front, front <laughs> that's hard to say fast, uh, wherein the, uh, there's a, a workforce or a task force that was um, convened to help inform uh, the Federal Department of Labor of how to um, guide ERISA groups in this effort. So we don't want to um, risk any redundant work. So we're waiting till those guidelines are released before we um, may, uh, pick that work back up. So um, that initially was uh, interrupted by the pandemic. We were right in the middle of that effort when that uh, people's priorities understandably shifted. So that's just temporarily postponed. Um, 
We're also in the process of expanding the discharge data. So according to some um, additional statutory obligations that I didn't review, we now um, will be including ambulatory surgical centers in that data set. Uh, we are also um, hoping to add the Vermont Psychiatric um, Care Hospital um, in the coming biennium. Um, and data linkage is an ongoing process. Uh, the Data Governance Council approved a new policy to help us uh, administer um, appropriate data linkage within the constraints passed down to us. Um, and uh, so that's in place and there's some exciting projects underway. Um, the cancer registry at the Vermont Department of Health has uh, been linked to the claims data to look at some um, disparities in detection of cancer, particularly for those living in rural communities. So we're really excited to see some of the work that comes out of that project. Um, the other focus area under the first domain is improving the quality and ease of use of our data resources. So one project that was um, still underway is um, our enhanced data validation project and um, analyzing the available data sets. So that means trying to see how well we can coordinate vCares and VUDs and actually doing a financial um, look from both the provider and payer standpoint of how the data in vCares matches their records. So that's underway and uh, should be completed uh, in the near future. Uh, we also uh, completed a data course for board members and we will be uh, renewing that. That's gonna be something that happens every, um, every couple of years. So we'll be doing that again in 2022. Um, yeah, and so then under the patient care and understanding access and cost to care focus area, uh, we released two new dashboards, a patient migration analysis that shows where Vermont residents are going to get their care and a patient origin analysis, which um, helps us understand where patients are coming from who are seen at Vermont's hospitals. Um, we also um, have been supporting the APM reporting. That's an ongoing obligation of ours. Um, and then we also uh, have a reimbursement vari val variation project underway. So that um, is a statutory requirement that will be published publicly in February. So we're uh, gonna start uh, releasing some drafts of that in the coming um, couple months. So that is on track. And then uh, we have kind of postponed the decomposition study. We had a pretty good start on it, but um, given some feedback we were getting from board members and some staffing constraints, we would like to make sure that before we go further with that, it's truly integrated in the regulatory process. Um, so in, that's a good segue to our last domain, regulatory integration. So um, integrating regulatory decision-making using data, um, we were gonna do some proof of concepts related to healthcare utilization and cost for Vermonters, but we postponed that for some other work that will be forthcoming uh, later this month related to these topics. And we'll probably be turning our attention back to extending that work after that's released. And then the last uh, bucket of work is uh, always ongoing and that's the health resource allocation plan. So we were able to gather some inventories and publish some of those on our website. Um, we're now turning our attention to ways to um, refresh the data, um, which is also contingent on some constraints with our partners at the Vermont Department of Health. They understandably have other priorities at the moment. Um, we've produced some new data visual visualizations related to this, um, particularly around access. And uh, we also have started to do some capacity, capacity and utilization research and are trying to um, incorporate some of those findings um, in board's regulatory work. So that's, you know, in, and COVID. So it's been a busy couple of years, I'll have to say. Um, so when we were thinking about um, the next two years of work, we had two organi organizing questions, and that is, how can our team better provide better information to support the board and its duties. And knowing that there are so many interesting and valuable questions ahead of us, where should our focus be? And so with the help of the Data Governance Council to focus some projects, the board members laid out some key priorities. One is that um, they felt like there could be more support from our team in the actual regulatory cycles. So some of our past work felt um, a little disconnected from the board decision process and that um, we really had some room to grow in terms of translating the data into actionable information from the board's perspective. Um, timeliness was definitely a theme of frustration. 
Um, and, you know, shouts out to the financial team. Um, a lot of the information that they've been producing has been really helpful and seems really um, integrated in the board's decision making. So they um, offered that as an example of um, something to strive to. And finally, um, as always, there just needs to be more understanding of reimbursement and cost variation, um, both for care delivered to Vermonters and the care del that's delivered in our state so that we can better kind of give background to the important decisions that the board faces. So we have three main domains <laughs> for the next two years. Regulatory integration is uh, a repeat, um, which I think it should be. And uh, the main kind of operational um, tasks we have in this domain are making sure that each regulatory process has a team member or members assigned to directly work with our staff experts who are the real content experts for the regulatory cycle so that we can fold in existing work more directly and help um, in for future development of you know reports or other information that might help with their um, their processes and um, also in crafting new metrics or tools that would really directly be incorporated in the regulatory process. Um, as far as data timeliness, we have a few objectives to improve that. Um, we are actively working on producing quarterly extracts of the hospital discharge data. So that would be kind of um, non-final subject to change, but at least more timely than the current annual um, release of that data. And longer term, we're going to be thinking through ways to further accelerate the um, that that stream of information. We're also looking at ways to get our claims data in faster. Um, and you know, me Medicare tends to be the biggest challenge there, so there are some options that we can continue to evaluate to help make the claims data a little bit more timely. And then um, more infrastructurally, we're looking at our data architecture and policies and procedures so that we can um, you know, produce things on a more timely basis and have things in place for automation and whatnot. And um, another important domain uh, is the data quality and utility one, where we are going to try to um, think about ways that we can simplify and focus um, some of the data collected from um, people submitting information um, so that, you know, it can be you know, even more valid and even more reliable and reduce burden on our submitters. And also think of ways that we can adapt our data to account for some of the no new payment models um, that we're seeing in our delivery system. Um, assuming that we're able to successfully um, get through our uh, rule revision, which I anticipate we will, we will next turn our attention to the vCare submission guide. Many of those principles that I just mentioned would be part of that process, but um, you know it's been over a decade since those data elements have been visited, so it's overdue. And we'll be thinking about um, other options um, to leverage, such as some of the new reporting required is in for federal interoperability requirements. Um, there's also uh, a universal um, submission data set that we might want to think about leveraging, and that will involve a lot of outreach with um, stakeholders to make sure that we can uh, make that as painless as possible. Um, we also are always looking for ways to enhance and extend our data. And here um, we want to help better support efforts at measuring and addressing issues related to equity in the healthcare delivery system. So we will be, um, as part of that data submission guide, trying to get race and ethnicity as required elements in the uh, all-payer claims database and also um, kind of working with partners um, to make sure that those data are collected um, you know, in, a, in a uniform way. And finally, data integration is kind of the, the big overarching uh, goal, I think, across the state. So thinking of ways that we can bring data together um, in a uh, safe way that protects privacy concerns. So that is, um, you know, what we're we're planning to tackle over the next couple of years. So I guess I'm here to address any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'll open it up to board members for questions of Sarah. I don't have any questions, Sarah. I just want to thank you for this thoughtful presentation, and I'm really excited about you know the initiatives that we're that you're embarking on and how it's going to be helpful to our regulatory process. So just a big thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
I, I, yeah, I, sorry, I, would, I would like to, I'm getting, I'm getting some feedback here. Um, to, to add to that, I, um, you know, I, I think it would be helpful at some point in time to just make sure that um, we've kind of covered the landscape of requests, both from board members and from, say, our director, sectional d directors, that um, so that we know kind of what's 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 moving forward um, and what's not. Like um, for me, for example, obviously price trans. Uh, Transparency has always been a big issue for me, and that's baked in here. I, I can see that. But something that's not baked in is how we use our data in the context of um, the uh, re-examination and re uh, re reconstruction of the Vermont's QHP benchmark plan, which is going to be happening in the near term in, in, in the com coming months. And statutorily, given what the legislature passed, we're kind of on the hook for participating in that. And so, you know, for me, kind of looking at the QHP population, which is one that we, you know, regulate both in terms of, of rates, uh, premiums, et cetera, and have some some uh, review of their co-pays and deductibles. But under but that plan was crafted back in 2013 before all the health care reform. Uh, effort in Vermont got off got off the landing strip, and so mm -hmm. so it would be helpful to kind of look at where we've been or where we are uh, with that um, in order to and uh, and the legislature has five or six new items that they want to add as benefits, which are certainly going to be costly. Um, and there are some benefits like uh, that don't exist there, for example, like pre pre diabetes, which is one of our big uh, chronic diseases. So, uh, you know, I mean, whether we do it or not, I would just like to know, you know, that we're going to do it or not. But I do think that we can be very helpful in an area where we have powerful regulatory authority in terms of the QHP, um, uh, um, you know, policies and plans and can be in a position to advise DIVA and uh, DFR and, and the legislature and some of our other partners as to where we are, how we're following the money now, how we're spending the money now, and and how adjustments might be made that make that uh, benchmark plan the best it can be. But I'm really impressed with the work that you've done. It's uh, always been, uh, uh, you know, good quality and um, uh, looking forward to uh, the next couple of years. Okay, any other questions or comments from board members? I don't have any questions or comments, but I just want to also echo thanks, Sarah, to you and the team for all your hard work. And Sarah, um, is the open position currently posted? Yes. Might be a good time now to plug uh, that there's a position open and uh, maybe some people that are uh, or uh, at this meeting can share it out to their network. Yeah, so we're uh, hiring for uh, another analyst on the team, hoping with some someone with a, a data science background to help with some of that automation and um, um, integration work that I mentioned. So it's on our website. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks, Sarah. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over for public comment on the presentation about our 2022-23 analytics plan. Um, does any member of the public wish to comment at this time? Um, Sam Peich, Sam. Hi everyone, this is Sam I'm at the HCA. I just just two quick comments. I just want to thank Sarah for all the work on this and the team, in particular the focus on integrating race ethnicity data. I think it's incredibly important, and I think we'll have major implications for doing racial disparities analyses, which are important I think for everyone in the state. Um, and also to say that I mean, as someone that recently graduated graduate school, um, I'm happy to forward the position to friends uh, that are still in that orbit uh, looking for jobs. So happy to do that. 
Thank is there, you. Is there a way that we could post a, a link to the job posting into the chat for this meeting? We can turn the chat off for these meetings, don't we? No. What's that? Oh, okay. You're right. You're right. Oh, right. You're right. But you it's can on find our it on our website. Yeah, yeah. If you have any trouble finding it, let me know. Okay, next I'm going to turn to Walter Carpenter. And Walter, we've been hearing uh, reports from your neck of the woods that the foliage was spectacular this year. I'll send you some pictures, Kevin. Um, it was wild being out there. It didn't happen until late due to uh, global warming, I think. And it's still going on, but we had people from all over the world there. Um, Africa, Europe, Asia, um, the Middle East, everywhere. I felt like I was in part of a United Nations, but I'll send some pictures to Christine to pass around. Um, that would be great. It's uh, and, good to hear that uh, Mother Nature is uh, um, creating a beautiful landscape for uh, tourists from all over the world to come to. It's incredible. And people come to Vermont because it is such an enigma in the Nash on the national scene. And as one person from the South said to me, why aren't they putting shopping malls all over here like they're doing down south and everything? Um, it, it's kind of phenomenal when you talk to people from all over the country about the state, the foliage, all the rest of it, you know, and here we have a, you know, a state in America that is all of a sudden is beautiful and is not trying to waste itself to commercialism. Uh, it, it's, it's really, it's really in something. It's coming incredulous in a way. And then you have people from China, India, um, <clears throat> Pakistan, Britain, uh, France, asking me about this and that about Vermont and about why is it so different than the USA as a whole? And it's kind of interesting to ex try to explain that. You know, we have a Green Mountain Care Board, for example, which is the only one of its kind in, this, in the nation, to my knowledge. We were the first to do the, <clears throat> the marriage thing with civil unions, and that's hard for so many people to grasp. <laughs> but my question here is, um, great on the data, and I know it involved a whole lot of difficult work, just as difficult as it is to be in the tourist business at times. And I just want to know what this data is going to do for the general public in regard to access or how it will help that. And I will send those pictures to Christine. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's um, the other, we're, we're exper experimenting with ways that we can provide um, information that's helpful across the spectrum. And um, yeah, uh, you know, vCares is being used to help um, answer a lot of questions um, across the state. And uh, I, kn I know, I expect that it'll be one of the resources that's tapped in looking at the state's investigation into wait times and that that access issue but um yeah i guess so walter um just to follow up on that um we have been accessing um the two databases in the sustainability planning which does provide information that can be translated into um, access questions as well and um we've also been forwarding um, information to um, uh, the group that is working on access. And Jess, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how you might envision information in the databases as being useful to that. Sure. So I, th I think what we're going to, the databases are really helpful for a historical view um, because you can certainly use claims data and discharge data to look at, you know, utilization over time. I think what we're trying to figure out right now is how to get point in time data on, um, on access right now. So the claims databases aren't as helpful in that regard. Uh, 
So we're trying to identify what are the benchmarks for how we want to think about access, what are the right questions that we need to ask, and I think we're going to be um, initiating some surveys potentially to try and gather some information from providers. So I think the issue largely with the claims databases is that they're, uh, you know, they're a look back, right? And we're trying to understand a look ahead and, and at the current uh, landscape for access. So that's one of the drawbacks of, of the databases that we have, those two databases. But they'll be helpful in trying to understand utilization over time. Yeah, that's the key. We'll, we'll have... Uh, something to uh, compare what the new information uh, brings in to. And, and uh, you know, that's going to, uh, um, Walter, it's the most frustrating thing in the world when we as the board are making decisions and we're looking at information that's two years old. And uh, I think that uh, each one of us gets uh, frustrated at times, um, but it's the nature of the claims run out and uh, it's the nature of the world that we live in. And that's something that we've been trying to uh, accelerate, but we're not a, nowhere near a point in time where we're even close to having something that has instantaneous information. And I would just say statewide, there's you know efforts where we're trying to make claims and clinical information work together a little bit better because um, that that's something that as a patient might actually be really helpful. So. You know, for instance, your doctor might be able to know if a prescription was filled and like, oh, did you remember you had that prescription? <laughs> like Stuff like that. Okay. Is there other public comment? If not, um, Sarah, I want to thank you for a great presentation. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll get lots of uh, great applicants because um, I know that your team um, um, could use the uh, help because we're tasking you to do an awful lot. And uh, so thank you very much for everything that you do for the people of Vermont. Yeah, and I would say that the members of the team are the ones that really deserve the thanks. So um, I'm fortunate to work with such a great group and uh, thank you for your time. Okay, so I understand from uh, Abigail that um, the minutes should have said um, Wednesday, September 15th. And if somebody would like to make a motion, if they could, um, in that motion, uh, correct the minutes to reflect that the 15th meeting was on a Wednesday. Would someone like to make a motion? Sure, I move that we approve. Um, Hold on, I just need to. It's the minutes of uh, Monday, September 13th and Wednesday, September 15th. If that's okay. helpful. That <laughs> is exactly what I was looking for. Uh, I move that we approve the minutes of Monday, September 13th and the minutes of Wednesday, September 15th with a correction to, from, uh, to indicate that the 15th was a Wednesday. Is there a second? second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, approve the minutes as corrected. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Let the record show that uh, that was passed unanimously. So now we're gonna turn our attention to a discussion of the 2022 budget guidance and reporting requirements for Medicare only non-certified accountable care organizations. That's a mouthful and I'm gonna turn it over to Russ McCracken, Russ. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna share my screen here. <clears throat> All right, can you see my screen? We can, yes. All right, great, thank you. Um, so I'm presenting for uh, the board to uh, start discussion and consideration for guidance and reporting requirements for Medicare-only non-certified ACOs uh, for 2022. It's the first time that the board has had guidance for uh, this type of, of ACO. Um, I'd like to start with a um, quick framing of this uh, under the statute. Um, 
<clears throat> a Medicare only ACO is not required to be certified by the board under statute. Uh, 18 BSA 9382 requires certification for ACOs that receive Medicaid or commercial insurance payments, um, not Medicare only. However, a Medicare only ACO is still subject to the annual budget review and approval um, in 18 BSA 9382B2, uh, which tells the board to adopt rules um, for reviewing and approving the budgets of ACOs divided between those that have more than 10,000 attributed lives in Vermont uh, and those that have fewer than 10,000 attributed lives. Um, the board, the board's applicable rule here is uh, Rule 5.405, uh, and it says um, in deciding whether to approve or modify the proposed budget of an ACO that will have 10,000 attributed lives or uh, fewer than 10,000 attributed lives, Jesus the Christ. board takes into consideration benchmarks established under 5402, uh, criteria set out in the statute that the board deems appropriate to the ACO size and scope. Um, elements of the ACO's payer specific programs that are applicable to uh, the all payer model um, and uh, any other issues uh, at the discretion of the board. <clears throat> so with that context, what we've done here is prepared a draft guidance that is more uh, streamlined and, and appropriate in size than what the board looks at for uh, One Care Vermont, which has uh, significantly more attributed lives in the state. Um, I also want to note uh, in the rule in 5404, uh, calls for the board to have a public hearing and review of the ACO's budget, um, except that the board may decline to hold a hearing concerning a proposed budget uh, for an ACO that has fewer than 10,000 attributed lives in Vermont. And I, I just flag that now as something um, for a little bit of consideration and discussion as we go through the actual um, draft guidance. Uh, so the scope of this guidance is, is fairly limited. It's for an ACO that's not certified by the board, participates only in Medicare, not Medicaid or commercial payers and has fewer than 10,000 attributed lives in the state. Uh, currently, there is only one ACO that fits this requirement, uh, which is a direct contracting entity uh, managed by Clover Health. And I'll, I'll talk about the procedural background here as a reminder in just a minute. But the guidance is set up in a generic way that would apply to any ACO meeting these criteria. Um, and I, I think I did note for the board that there are there is another potential new entrant, um, but at the, at the moment there's only one ACO um, for which this guidance would apply. Um, so the procedural background, just to, to um, uh, refresh everyone's memory, um, Clover Health requested a waiver. Uh, from the board of Rule 5.4, which is the budget review, and 5.5, uh, which is monitoring and, and oversight. Uh, Clover Health was in to a board meeting over the summer, early summer, and or late spring, and made a presentation, requested a waiver. Uh, the board deliberated and declined the waiver request and asked staff to prepare uh, budget guidance and process working with Clover and the HCA. So the draft that you're seeing today has been prepared by legal and policy staff. Uh, both the HCA and Clover Health have reviewed and commented on it. Um, we've had calls uh, with both Clover Health representatives and the HCA to discuss, uh, discuss the draft and understand their, their comments and their feedback. Um, and so with that, I'd like to switch over and actually go through the guidance itself. All right, and hopefully I'm still presenting. You are. Great. 
Um, I won't, uh, I'll, I'll go through the guidance. I, I don't want to read every question in the guidance, um, but if there are um, clarifications or or comments specific to any section, I'm happy to take those as we go through or uh, address, address them at the end. <clears throat> Um, so I'll start here. The background uh, sets out roughly what I've just gone through in terms of the scope of this guidance. Um, we also have a timeline here. You'll see that it's the the dates are still bracketed um, to be finalized based on um, the board's review and approval here. And then I also wanted to note that. Going forward in future years, our intent would be to align these dates with um, with the dates that we have uh, received review and the board um, approves or adjust one care for months budget, so that they would be on the same uh, the same cycle. I think we we received a comment from Clover Health, and I, I think we acknowledge that the date and the timing is always a bit of a challenge. Um, in terms of how the ACO finalizes its plans for the coming year, um, to have something that they could submit in response to a, a budget review um, and then have the board review and, and actually approve it. Uh, but our intent is to have the dates aligned with the One Care uh, Vermont process. Um, introductory, um, which is some largely tracking what we have in our rule. Um, the ACO can request confidential treatment um, for anything that it submits, and that request would be uh, dealt with according to the Vermont Public Records Act. Um, I'll also note here that recognizing that Medicare only ACOs are participants in Medicare programs. Um, we think it's appropriate to allow an ACO to uh, respond to these some of the questions here um, to the extent they can by reference to um, a participation agreement with Medicare or a specific requirement, programmatic requirement of um, whatever Medicare model they're participating in. Uh, and that sort of runs through the whole the whole guidance. Uh, so we, we collect some basic information about the ACO, its background, um, governing documents for the ACO, uh, questions about the ACO's executive leadership team. Um, I did get some specific comments from the healthcare advocate that um, we've incorporated throughout, and I'll. I might not note all of them, but I will note to here the um, inclusion of a conflict of interest policy for the governing body and any ACO compensation structure that's uh, tied to a performance that might reduce the amount paid for patient care. Um, next, we ask about uh, material pending legal actions against the ACO or its affiliates, against uh, its executive leadership team related to their duties or any actions known to be contemplated by government authorities. Uh, similarly, questions going to the character of the ACO, um, whether it's a uh, leadership team or board members are um, uh, subject to legal action or findings indicating uh, wrongful action. Um, we ask if, if the ACO has any other accreditations and ask them to provide that. The next section broadly addresses the ACO's provider network. Uh, so for each ACO, and um, there is an appendix that accompanies this, but it, it largely tracks the questions that you're seeing here. Um, ask the ACO to provide the name of their providers, uh, provider type, um, the payment model that they have with the, the that provider participates in, um, uh, whether they have uh, specialty providers, and 
whether they know for a provider what their what percent of that patient population is going to be attributed to the ACO. Um, as for a brief narrative uh, summary of each uh, contract type and payment model that the ACO uses for providers. Um, and then uh, a, a couple of questions here. If the ACO has providers that are assuming uh, a downside risk, we ask them the ACO to describe that contract with the provider, um, what percentage of the downside risk the provider is taking, whether that downside risk is capped, what the mitigation, um, whether there are requirements for the provider to mitigate that risk. Um, the concern here would be um, what risk there is, if, if any, that uh, Vermont providers are taking on um, or being exposed to a risk that, that might jeopardize their um, solvency or their ability to um, you know, fully function uh, under the ACO model. Uh, we asked for a template of the provider's contracts, um, asked them to describe any referral programs that, uh, that the ACO uses, and then asked them to describe um, their network development strategy, uh, how if they intend to bring new providers in Vermont into the ACO, how they might do that, um, whether there's a difference between an independent versus a hospital-owned practice in that strategy, um, and then uh, if there are certain types of providers. Russell, uh, the next section. I'm sorry, go ahead. I either lost you or you just stopped talking for a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, am I back on now? Yep. Okay. I got a bad network quality message, um, which is unusual. Uh, okay. Moving on to the ACO's payer programs. Um, our expectation, I think, is that a lot of these questions could be addressed um, by reference to, um, say, a direct contracting entity's participation agreement with Medicare. Recognizing that this is a, a generic, you know, this is generic guidance, um, we are asking the questions here and, and asking the ACO to provide a, a response to it. Um, but you, as you'll see, the first question is asking for a copy of the participation agreement or um, other relevant agreement with uh, with CMS governing the ACO's um, involvement with the, the applicable program. <clears throat> um, and we ask, we have a, another appendix here, but it, it again tracks, I think, these items um, asking for attributed lives, attribution methodology, uh, projected spending or payments that the ACO uh, expects that for those attributed lives, um, any benefit enhancements under the CMS program that the ACO um, intends to participate in. Um, ask them to describe their risk sharing agreement with CMS, whether it's a, a full risk, um, a 50% risk, if it's something else, um, whether there's a minimum savings rate, minimum loss rate, or other similar concept. Uh, whether that risk corridor is capped, um, what the risk mi uh, mitigation provisions might be in their agreement, um, and what's the method that CMS uses for uh, setting the budget target. Um, uh, a, a couple of further questions related to that point, I think. Um, Categories of services included for determining the ACO savings or loss, um, and then describing the, the ACO's benchmark or their capitation payment. Um, as for the list of quality measures that uh, CMS might use to um, <clears throat> determine the um, risk sharing uh, payment or the the payment under the um, 
applicable program. Uh, and then the methodology for uh, beneficiary member alignment. Uh, following that, we go to uh, the ACO's budget and financials. Um, we're asking for the most recent audited financials for a publicly traded company that might be information that's publicly filed for another ACO. Um, it's something that we would ask, uh, ask them to submit. Um, in the question that's cut off here at the bottom of the page, uh, we asked the ACO for a, a narrative, sort of a description of how the money flows between CMS, the ACO, the providers, um, and the patients. And along those lines, it's, it's a kind of a description of the ACO's business model. Um, part of that description would be how the ACO expects to realize savings and um, uh, some demonstration that the ACO has um, sufficient funds to support its administrative operations and, and meet its um, payment obligations. That's not a Vermont specific question. We, we do ask if it can be segmented the uh, dollar values of anticipated payments to Vermont providers. Um, and if it can be segmented related uh, anticipated savings from that. Um, next question would be for an ACO, it's taking the risk of loss. Um, ask them how they would manage their, uh, how they manage that liability if they have, um, Losses at 75% of their maximum exposure or or their the full amount of their maximum exposure. And so that would be um, what their kind of risk mitigation elements are, whether it's covered by a reserve um, or whether they use some other reinsurance or other methodology for that. Um, question uh, five here I want to note because it's asking specifically for data um, for 2021 and 2022 as an estimated budget. Um, the amount of fixed payments or shared savings distributed to Vermont participant providers. Um, and then the other questions are on an ACO wide basis, uh, shared savings or loss for the ACO. Um, shared savings uh, that they would invest in um, infrastructure or, or other resources like that. To providers on an ACO wide basis. The reason um, the question, the, I'm sorry, I may have cut out again. The reason the questions are set up this way is um, we recognize that a Medicare only ACO that's operating in multiple states likely doesn't have a Vermont specific budget. And so certain information um, might not be something we can reasonably ask for on a Vermont on a Vermont basis, but we could get on an ACO wide um, uh, and <clears throat> Sorry, on an ACO wide basis. Um, moving on to section five covers the ACO's model of care. Uh, and we ask them to describe their model of care, including a number of, of elements that are called out here. And we also ask whether their model of care improves performance on a number of specific measures and these are measures that, um, <clears throat> sorry, are pulled from the uh, Vermont's all payer, um, from our APM all payer model agreement with CMS. Uh, so the idea is to track whether what the ACO is doing aligns with uh, the quality metrics that the state is measuring under um, our all payer model agreement. Uh, 
Um, and a couple of other questions here, whether uh, the ACO has strategies for expanding uh, capacity in existing primary care. Um, broadly, describing the ACO's population health initiatives um, and how the ACO might assess the performance and success of those initiatives. Um, and then a copy of the ACO's uh, grievance and complaint process. Uh, the last section of the guidance here includes a um, a chart that we uh, collect specifically in, in this form from um, from One Care Vermont, and it is um, what we use to determine whether it's a scale target qualifying um, initiative. Uh, so I, I won't go through I won't go through that in um, in detail here. Um, so that that's a a walk through the guidance. Um, hopefully everyone's still awake. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, like I said, we, we've had some, we had a discussion with Clover Health, we had a discussion with the HCA. Um, uh, if I can kind of broadly summarize the, those questions, and I, I don't, um, if I'm not doing it justice, I see uh, Dave uh, is on the screen here and he can, <laughs> he can, he can um, correct me <clears throat> for Clover. Um, but I, I think the kind of the big question here is um, that we've been asked from Clover is um, an understanding of how the board intends to use the information that's being collected, um, understanding what um, the board might uh, approve or adjust under the broad umbrella of um approving or or modifying a, the ACO's budget um you know so understanding what gets adjusted um recognizing that there are some elements of of the ACO's operations that are set by CMS requirement and there are some that are um kind of broad multi-state aspects of the ACO's budget uh, and Clover also expressed some concern about um, the timing that I alluded to at the beginning and what happens um, for adjustments that are made mid-year um, if the ACO is, is really not able to make those that kind of adjustment mid-year. And um, sort of what, uh, what other standards or criteria is the board going to apply um, as a, a guidance or a benchmark for, for approval of the budget. Um, and, and so I, you know, I know uh, we did speak with Clover uh, about those questions, but I think those are, are um, uh, sort of their, their comments. Um, and I guess with that, uh, I'll, I'll stop and um, uh, turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, for board uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much, Russ. Are there questions or comments from the board? This is Robin. I don't have uh, questions for Russ, but I thought I would just um, chime in with some thoughts about um, the questions that he had just raised. For me, I think the Medicare only ACO budget process is a combination of transparency um, and ensuring that we have transparent information about all ACOs operating in our state, as well as having an understanding of the business model and the care, the care model. Um, in particular, 
so that we can understand how it that particular ACO fits or doesn't fit into the overall direction that the state is headed in. I think it's important for us to understand those factors. Um, I, I do think that in because it's a Medicare ACO program that there's, um, you know, we'll have to see the information that we get, but there's, there's going to be, for me, I think the kinds of um, conditions that we could potentially put on a budget might include certain things around any area that either raise some concerns for Vermonters or uh, where we feel like we need more transparency. That's just without obviously having reviewed the budget, it's hard to kind of anticipate that in advance, but that's my current thinking on it. I think um, I like the approach, Russ, where uh, we can allow regulated entities with under 10,000 lives to point to other publicly available materials. I think that's a good way to ensure that uh, we're not being too burdensome, but also ensuring that we can have transparent information to understand um, how this fits into the bigger picture. Thanks, Robin. Russ, is this um, draft currently posted on our website? Uh, it is, yeah. And um, what is the earliest date that you would uh, expect the board to have a vote on this? Um, the earliest would, would be next week, um, but I, it doesn't need to be next week. Okay, so it could be the week after, but let's, mm -hmm. for the purposes of informing the public, ask them for public comment back by next Tuesday, and uh, we can make an, a judgment call on uh, whether or not it makes sense to uh, defer it another week or not. But um, so... Um, just so everyone knows the the draft document is posted to the website and we are um, taking public comment through next Tuesday at least. We always take public comment whenever it comes in anyways. So with that, um, Jess or Tom, do you have any comments or questions? I have a, a couple of quick ones, I think. Um, one, I just want to make sure I probably could have looked this up myself, but I want to make sure that the um, provision that requires um, the oath to be taken pursuant to 18 VSA 9374. Does that include the penalty as well? Is there a separate reference to the penalty for uh, associated with that oath or? I don't think I have a separate reference. So so the, I mean, I know in the hospitals that we have an oath, and if there's a violation of the oath, there are um, specific amounts, you know, that the hospital could be uh, liable for. And I'm just, just want to make sure that there's a dollar amount or some kind of penalty, explicit penalty, tied to uh, associated with that oath. Um. Well, you can you can you can look it up and tell me later. I just it's uh I, or I could look it up, but I, I'd rather have a lawyer look up a, a penalty rather than I, me. Yeah, I don't recall offhand. I can look it up. I can also see um and I it I, it just doesn't come to mind right now whether <clears throat> that's something we put in the oath itself um, in the the form of the oath that the hospitals filled out and, and signed. Um, but I, I can look it up and um, yep. we can include a reference to that uh, to that somewhere. And so um, my, my other question is just how um, this all might migrate toward fix, fixed prospective payments. Um, I As I read this um, in a number of sections, it talks about fixed prospective payments. But it's kind of asking um, uh, the ACO applicant to kind of tell us what they expect to happen, how much will be fee for service, how much risk there will be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm just wondering how we can structure this to maximize 
in the relationship should one occur that um, these fixed prospective payments be true fixed prospective payments and and leading us to the goal that we want um, in health care reform that uh, fee for service is diminished and fixed prospective payments uh, is enhanced. Uh, we know th from going through the recent hospital budget process that about 33% of the Medicaid payments in Vermont to hospitals are in some kind of a fixed prospective payment. But I'm just wondering if maybe we could take that um, HCP land framework to give this some structure. There's those four categories um, and, um, and just make sure that the applicant aligns their presentations with those and that as much as possible in our relationship or in our guidelines emphasize that um, we're big fans of fixed perspective payments, true fixed perspective fam payments, and not so much fee for service, especially since we're getting into small populations here. So that if there are a number of these ACOs below 10,000, the administrative cost, I would think, cumulatively would be more than the administrative cost associated with a, a 10,000 uh, attributed life plus ACO. So um, that's just kind of a thought in the back of my mind that uh, you know, we know where we want to go, which is fixed prospective payments. And so how do we structure these guidelines to encourage the applicant? to head in that direction as well as much as possible. That's more comment than a question. Okay, um, Jess, do you have any comments or questions? Not at this time. I'm actually looking forward to hearing if there's any public comment on this particular guidance, but I'm okay for now. Thank you. So at this point, I will open it up for public comment. And uh, also, I just want to uh, extend an invitation to both the healthcare advocate and to uh, David Alt, if you wish to uh, say anything further at this point, um, please feel free. So public comment, does anyone wish to speak? So David, I see your hand up. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, first, I just want to say thank you so much to the board staff, to in particular to, to Russ for all the openness and collaboration uh, in working with the stakeholders, obviously, including Clover uh, over the past few months of Davis, as they've assisted you all uh, in carrying out your statutory obligations regarding ACOs. Um, in particular, we, you know, they've really focused their efforts on trying to balance the need to protect the interests of Vermonters um, with the significant administrative burden that reporting obligations place on healthcare organizations uh, that, that are focused on coming into Vermont and improving healthcare in Vermont. So really appreciative of those efforts they've taken. Um, they've taken that very you know, seriously and, and really appreciate the engagement of conversation there. Um, so you know th that said, uh, you know Russ raised a couple of the the questions that that are to have been top of mind for us. Um, you know, at as sort of like a, a larger threshold um, matter. You know, two two points. One is is the one about it would be helpful to have an understanding as to you know as, as much as possible as to you know what are the standards uh, against which. Uh, reporting obligations are are being judged. Is it a subjective standard? Is it an objective standard? I understand the ultimate goal, right, is to is transparency to protect the citizens of Vermont and to make sure that the the health care that uh, Clover or other ACOs are providing in Vermont aligns with the the mission and vision of of the state of Vermont as a whole. So totally understand that, but but to be able to drill down a little bit more, um, and, and, and be able to have some better sense, um, if for no other reason than uh, to help ACOs, to help guide ACOs uh, that are in Vermont to be providing the kind of care uh, that aligns with, with what you're looking for for the state. Um, so so that, that, that's one sort of overarching thought. The other overarching thought um, is, is just the idea of, and it ties into the first one, right? The idea of making sure that the reporting obligations 
um, are tied to those goals. So, you know, I, one thing, thing that I, I do think, you know, Russ and the team was looking at is as you look at them, trying to think about, all right, if we're reporting on, you know, X, Y, or Z, how does that further the goal or, or, or the obligation of the board to determine whether, um, you know, the, the ACO uh, should be operating in this state, right? So just to make sure that each piece of reporting and for reported information ha has, has a purpose. Um, and, you know, and, um, you know, while they've done a great job of narrowing it down from, uh, from some of the broader requirements for the all Vermont all payer model, um, you know, it is still a lot to report, um, even where you can sort of link to some publicly available data or provide a participation agreement. There are still a lot of parts of this, um, document that, that are onerous and require specific work, uh, just to Vermont. Um, and, and at times are even duplicative. So for instance, the section six um, is tables to be completed um, just to match the one, um, the one care of Vermont's forms. Um, and that's mostly information that's already being reported in section two or in section five. And it's just uh, an, you know, a, a task of doing it to make it simpler for the one care Vermont team to see whether they're meeting their obligations to Medicare, and so some of these, um, you know, so, some of these tasks, I, I, I think, still do place significant burden on any ACO that's coming into the state. Um, you know, and, and so one thing I would I would like to raise for your consideration, and, and this uh, is also something that that uh, we've spoken to to Ross and Michael and and um, others about. Um, is the idea of obviously there's this over 10,000 uh, over 10,000 patient under 10,000 patient threshold for uh, for which rules or which reporting requirements apply, um, but also thinking about the idea about whether there should be some sort of a floor, right? And so if there's if there are ACOs that are very small have a very small footprint in the state. Um, you know, should there be limited applicability uh, of this guidance such that, you know, these onerous reporting obligations kick in only when there's some minimum a number of beneficiaries, some minimum threshold of, of Medicare beneficiaries in the state of Vermont th th that are participating as part of the ACO? Um, you know, again, if it was, you know, whatever a number like 100 or 200 patients you know, this ongoing um, obligation, you know, obviously the, 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 the weight of that burden becomes larger in, in compared to, to the size of the patient. So really want to, to pose that to you all uh, for your con consideration. And in fact, um, you know, in, in, in tying it in actually to uh, your statutory mandate, when you look at the statutory mandate for um, the rules that you put in place for ACOs that are under 10,000 uh, beneficiaries, it actually says that those, you know, it's the rules that you deem appropriate specific to an ACO's size and scope. And so I think that, you know, there's a calling there for you to be able to take that kind of consideration uh, into account. Um, and so the, the, those were the, um, the comments that, that we wanted to come with. Kevin Murphy from Clover is with us. So, you know, he's down in the weeds of the day-to-day -day operations, um, you know, of, of, of Clover. So he's certainly here to you know, answer any questions that you may have or, or any additional feedback as well. Um, in terms of uh, a couple of things that I just heard, I don't want to take too much of your, your time, but on the timeline piece, just to you know, elaborate on that a little bit, the way it works for um, ACOs, and I don't mean just the direct contracting Andes, but I, this is actually true pretty much across the board for all Medicare only ACOs, that they have to, any individual ACO has to decide where and how it's participating pretty much by the end of August of, of the year before. So for instance, um, August of 2021 was when Clover had to make a decision about whether, whether and where it was participating for 2022. And after that time, um, they cannot mm. pull back. So they are going, whether they actually operate in the state or operate wherever or not, they are responsible for the care of those beneficiaries for the following year. Um, and so I just wanted to, to, to point that out because it's something sort of that is unique to the program. Um, and uh, so I, I thought worth mentioning, and that's why we had talked about timeline and how, how it might make sense. Obviously this year is, is a different situation because of the development of the guidelines for the first time, but just in looking at future years and, and you know putting that out there for your consideration. Um, and um, 
Let's see. Uh, I, I think those were my only other points uh, that I wanted to raise. Obviously, happy to answer any questions um, th that you have. Um, for Member Pelham, um, with respect to your question about um, fixed prospective payments, um, you know, I, what I can say about that is that, you know, obviously these are Medicare only ACOs, and Medicare only ACOs are operating in the fee for service space, right? And so while this is all coming from a background of fee for service, what the ACO models are intended to do and their whole purpose is to get away from fee for service, is to get away from paying for volume and, and instead paying for value. And so the more advanced or progressive of a ACO model or ACO initiative than ACO is, is participating in, more of those, those payments are going to be driven to upfront prospective payments um, to that kind of, of um, engagements with providers. So, uh, you know, instead of a provider being paid for just seeing as many patients as possible, paying that provider for, for really high value care. Um, and so that is where, um, and Kevin could speak more too, but that, that's where Clover is. And it, as a direct contracting entity in sort of the most advanced or sophisticated of the ACO initiatives, um, they are the furthest down the line on that, um, on that scale or on that track to, to move away from fee-for-service. So I'll, I'll pause there, but happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you, David. I'm going to proceed with uh, public comment, and then if uh, board members wish to ask you questions, they can afterwards. So, you, um, Walter Carpenter. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm not just a just a small question, perhaps related to this presentation. How many of these direct con contracting eight entities are operating in this state right now? just one or is it several or one that i'm aware of but then rush you alluded to uh the possibility of another um <clears throat> there's just one direct contracting entity operating in vermont that we're aware of um there's a potential we were contacted by another potential new entrant but not a direct contracting entity uh, it was under a different uh, medicare uh, program, um, but that that's not operating in the state currently. Mm. And is there any way to stop them? Well, they do have to meet the requirements under uh, Act 113, and that's what uh, um, these rules are um, this draft mm -hmm. guidance is uh, um, a result of. I guess what I would say is it's uh, it's a Medicare program, which is a federal program. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing none, do any board members have questions for David or Kevin? Russ, do you have anything in addition to add? <clears throat> um, I'm wondering, <clears throat> I'm trying to think through what the, you know, what the best approach um, process wise is um, for us. And yeah, I think we we <clears throat> yeah the board has heard some uh, comments from from Clover. I don't know if it would be helpful um, to have some time to reflect on those um, to look at the at the guidance again. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is I don't have anything else uh, for this meeting, but. Um, 
I really heard four things um, from Clover. Um, one was um, the standards for reporting, making sure that uh, they're understandable and and um, objective um, or subjective. Um, number two, making sure that um, reporting obligations are tied to the goals. Number three is the timeline question, which is if there's anything that can be done there, seems to make sense. And number four was um, a straight exemption for small entities. And I think that if the board had been inclined to go that route, um, there might have been a different outcome at the hearing over the summer. So um, I think that one can almost be scratched off the list. Um, but th that's what I heard, Russ. Um, yeah, that, that's what I heard as well. I think on the, <clears throat> the threshold question, what one scenario that I, I agree with what the board addressed earlier this summer is whether entities below a certain uh, threshold would be um, not subject to a budget review process. Um, it's also, I, and I'll, I'll just, I just wanted to kind of point it out, put it out there is that the board could decline to hold a public hearing for entities below a certain threshold, um, depending on how the board felt. Um, yep, and we have that ability uh, to uh, not hold public hearings on uh, hospital budgets as well. So that, that is a possibility. I'm, I'm curious, we haven't heard anything from the healthcare advocate. Um, is there anything that the healthcare advocate wishes to uh, say at this time? This uh, is Sam. Uh, no, go ahead, Eric, if you're gonna go. Uh, sure, I just, I mean, I think at this, so the board staff has been in contact with uh, various members of the HCA, um, and we found those meetings very productive and we appreciate um, the input on the guidance and are, are happy with the collaboration and the compromises reached. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. So Russ, maybe the best thing is um, to sleep a little bit on the points that were brought up today and perhaps having some additional conversations with the HCA and with uh, Clover. And um, we'll go back at this next week. Um, hopefully we'll have had a chance to uh, receive some other public comment and uh, really uh, have some uh, time to be able to um, think about uh, all the language that's in the draft now. But I got to tell you, Russ, uh, as always, I'm very impressed with the work that uh, you do and very thankful that you're part of the GMCB team. Great. And, Thank you. And Ch Chairman, if, if I may just say one more thing before we move on. If, Certainly, if David. Allowed. Th thank you so much. Um, I, I would just really request that before you scratch off that, that fourth item regarding a minimum threshold that you, know, you do give it some consideration in that I think it is different from what was uh, discussed over the summer, early in the summer. Again, the idea being the, the request for the waiver early in the summer was you know, a request to have no reporting requirements for any ACO up to 10,000 beneficiaries, right? Which is a sizable number of beneficiaries because that's you know where this uh, the statute delineates between large and small. And so I, I think this is just sort of looking at it another way that you know it now that we see what these what this uh, guidance is, what the reporting is, if you know if an ACO has is working with say one provider in a state, right? Uh, and a small number of beneficiaries, you know, it, if you're actually looking at the purpose and the goals of the reporting, right, it, it, it is, are they necessary at that point? Or do they really kick in and become necessary when there is enough of, um, you know, there are enough Vermonters that, or, or enough providers in the state 
um, that, that are engaged that obviously, you know, it, th then the burden warrants, obviously, um, you know, the, the review and, and, and that level of, of reporting. So I, not to be a dead horse, I just wanted to, to ask that you please do just give that some consideration before just scratching it off the list. I think we hear you pretty loud and clear. David, uh, let me ask you a follow-up question to what you just said. Sure. In the current scenario, um, are we talking about 20 providers or one because it's one practice? Um, well, oh, you mean the one that I was throwing out? Um, I mean, we, you could say it either way. So it could be one practice with 20 providers and, I don't know, 100 patients, or it could be you know, a, a solo practitioner with one doc and 20 patients. And I, I probably would put both of those on the, you know, on this, on the smaller side, as opposed to, again, if you have, whether it's a, a practice or individual docs, but, you know, if it's a total of say, I don't know, you know, 50 providers and, you know, 50 docs or something, and they have, I don't know, 4,000, 3,000 beneficiaries, right? And again, this is all Medicare beneficiaries. This isn't patients as a whole, right? I mean, so that's sort of the the, the gradient scale. So I, I, I was just pulling one as sort of one out of the air. But I mean, you could think of it as one doc or one practice. Okay, thank you. Board members, any follow-up? I'm good for now, thank you. Okay, it looks like we'll be coming back to this. And uh, again, public comment is open and I strongly encourage anyone with thoughts to uh, um, send them our way. So with that, Russ, I guess you can stop sharing your screen and we'll move to the old business portion of the agenda. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of the day.